silent movie villain. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll go ahead and get started. Nahmadu wa nasalli ala rasulu nabiya kareem. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. As-salatu wa s-salamu alayhi. Ya Sayyid al-Mursaleen. Ya Khatum al-Nabiyyin. Ya Shafiq al-Mudnabiyyin. Ya Anis al-Ghariyyin. Ya Rahmat al-Alameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, last few weeks we've been talking about Imam Hassan al-Islam. And... You know, last week, we really kind of wrapped up the aspect of the Khilafah itself. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, he comes back to Medina Munawwara. And the governor of Medina at this time is Marwan bin Hakam. And it's important to understand who he is in order to understand the environment. You know, it's sort of like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, you know, when he talks about Musa al-Islam, he also talks about Fir'aun. You know, so there's that antagonist. Uh, so when he talks about Ibrahim al-Islam, he also talks about Namrud. Uh, and so, you know, it's important like in the, in, in the situation with Musa al-Islam, it's also important for us to understand who Fir'aun is so that we understand what is going on better. Uh, and also to understand shaitan so that we understand the tricks of shaitan and how uh, you know the deception works so there's a lot of people again you know they always want to just say no no just talk about the good well you can't really talk about just the good unless you also understand the bad uh, so you also you don't just want to know what you need to do but you also want to know what you need to stay away from uh, because that's part of the trick of shaitan is that he makes these other things seem so good. And Allah SWT mentions that in the Quran as well, that he makes your deeds or your bad deeds seem good. Um, and so there's so many examples of that today, and especially with the social media aspect of things where, you know, they know the psychology, so they know how, you, how to draw you in and how to get you addicted to whatever you're doing, which ends up wasting the whole day. Uh, so that's why it's important to understand who Marwan is, because, and especially these days, where you have so many people who praise Marwan. You have so many people talking about him as a Sahabi. Uh, you have people naming their children after Marwan uh, and Yazid. So, you know, things get very messed up very quickly. But before we talk about Marwan specifically, uh, certain aspects that we need to understand uh, when we're talking about the companions of Rasulullah <laughs> those with him, uh, and those that were not ju just companions by the true definition of companion, but those that were there at the time. And because Allah SWT, he mentions this in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, Surah number nine, starting from verse number 100. So, because there is a hierarchy to things. And there is a hierarchy amongst the slaves of Allah. And so, verse number 100, where Allah starts off with, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, wa sabiqoon al-awwaloon min al-muhajirin wal-ansar, wal-ladhina attaba'uhu hum bil-ihsan. Radiallahu anhum wa radu And here in the Yusuf Ali translation it says the vanguard of Islam. Sadiqun al awalun those who you know were ahead of everyone else in accepting Islam. Uh, the first to accept Islam, those who who uh, beat everyone else in the acceptance of Islam. And these are the people who accepted Islam when there was nothing to gain by accepting Islam. Uh, you know, if you think about it, you know, uh, when there's something to gain, everybody jumps in. Uh, when there's nothing to gain worldly, then everybody kind of backs off. Uh, or they're hesitant. Or, you know, if you have something that, that's new to people, 
you know, they're, they're waiting to see, okay, let somebody else try it first, and then if, if they're successful, then I'll do the same thing. But the reward goes to those, the real reward goes to those who saw the clarity of things right off the bat, and they jumped in wholeheartedly right at the beginning. And this is where Allah found that these people, he says, you know, <laughs> those who, who were the first in, in the vanguards, as you translate here, uh, the first of those who forsook, forsook their homes and those who gave their, them aid and also those who follow them in all good deeds. Well pleased is Allah with them as are they with him. For them hath he prepared gardens on the which rivers flow to dwell therein forever. That is the supreme triumph. And here, radi Allah anhum wa radu an. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. You know, and people say, well, if Allah is pleased with you, well, you know, the other aspect of this is, you know, those who are happy with whatever Allah decides for them. Even in the difficult times, they are pleased with their Lord. They aren't complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the next verse, certain of the desert Arabs round about you are hypocrites, as well as among the Medina folk. They are obstinate in hypocrisy. Thou knowest them not, we know them, twice shall we punish them. And, and in addition shall they be sent to a grievous chastisement. Uh, so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing that yeah, just everybody that's walking around claiming to be believers aren't believers. Uh, and this again, this again is at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as well as today. You know, but this isn't just today, this is even then. So those walking around, you know, those who are in appearance, seeing Rasulullah because you know, the definition of Sahabi is someone who sees Rasulullah with Iman and dies on that Iman. But these are people who are seeing Rasulullah but they don't have any Iman. You know, not because, you know, and they themselves may think that, yeah, we are believers. But Allah SWT says, no, they're not. They're hypocrites walking around. You see them, and Allah says that, you know, uh, and, and, and in appearance, they seem like Muslims. Allah says you don't recognize them. But Allah recognizes them. And of course, Allah has, has given this knowledge to his Habib, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you had those then as well as today. Yeah. Others there are who have acknowledged their wrongdoings they have mixed an act that was good with another that it was evil. Perhaps Allah will turn unto them in mercy, for Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Of their wealth, they ta uh, take alms, and then you know, it kind of goes on into some of the characteristics of, of those people, uh, you know, of the good um, and those who work righteousness. So again, you have those who who were the believers, who are the believers, and then you have those who were hypocrites, and then you have those who kind of, you know, yeah, they were believers, but they kind of did some bad things as well as some good things, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perhaps will turn to them with his mercy. So this is important to understand this, and again, you know, these are things that probably a couple of centuries ago, we wouldn't really have to go over uh, because it was kind of general, un generally understood. But now when you have a lot of this propaganda, uh, and especially pushing these people, you know, because people love tyrants. You know, because tyrants, from the worldly standpoint, seem to be very successful. They have control. At least, seemingly, they have control. You know, they're in the big positions. Uh, oppressing everybody else. But again, that's why it's important and that's why Allah SWT has given us so many references in the Quran to the story of Musa al -Islam and Fir'aun. You know, Fir'aun, from the worldly standpoint, ah, he controlled everything. All the wealth, 
all the food supply, you know, all the control was his. But the reality was something totally different. So, when we look at now coming to Marwan, so again, it's important to understand him, to, to understand the environment that Imam Hassan al-Islam and Ahlul Bayt are living in in Medina because he will be the governor of Medina Munawwara for the next seven years after they came back. And then he will be removed for, a couple, for about three years and then he will be made governor again. You know, for another three or four years, and then he will be removed, and it's just going to be kind of back and forth. And he will even become at one point the king of Banu Umayyah, or the leader of Banu Umayyah. Uh, and we'll get to that later on, inshallah. But according to most narrations, he was born uh, probably in Taif. And then, you know, his father is Hakam. So you have to understand the background here. So his father is Hakam. Hakam is the brother of Affan, who is the father of Uthman. So he is the father or the uncle of Uthman. Hakam, who is the father of Marwan, uh, was a very staunch enemy of Islam and Rasulullah. So that when Uthman in the early days accepted Islam and Hakam found out, he wrapped him up in a carpet and lit it on fire on both ends. Uh, and Abu Bakr is the one who saw this uh, and uh, basically uh, uh, freed Uthman from this predic predicament and you know, eventually brings him to Rasulullah uh, and actually housed him for a while. Uh, and of course, eventually, not too long after this, uh, Uthman rather will be married to the daughter of Rasulullah Sallallahu So, so this is the father of Marwan. When and Haq Marwan was born, as I said, probably in Taif, lived in Mecca. He was born, according to some narrations, like third year after Hijrah, and according to some other narrations, the fifth year after Hijrah. So uh, there's kind of so basically when Fatih Mecca, when Mecca is conquered, Marwan is roughly about three to five years old. Uh, and when Mecca is conquered, you know, you have a lot of people that are coming and, and accepting Islam, and amongst them is Marwan's father, Hakam. Uh, and then after the conquest of Mecca, when Rasulullah says, returns back to Medina Munawwara, Hakam also goes to Medina Munawwara. Yeah. And eventually, Hakam is exiled. There are, there are, yes. <coughs> Mute, Erda. There are differing, there are differing opinions uh, as to exactly why he was exiled. One thing that everybody agrees upon is that he would mock Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. Uh, so you kind of get a picture for, for his mindset right there. Uh, you know, when you listen, like the companions, they would describe the walk, the way Rasulullah would walk, and as if he was coming down, uh, you know, as if he was uh, coming down from a, uh, from a hill, you know, planting his feet firm. Uh, of course, when you mock somebody, you always over-exaggerate what they're doing. And so one time he was mocking the way Rasulullah was walking. Uh, you know, and he was doing this in this exaggerated manner. Uh, and Rasulullah of course, he sees behind him as well as he sees in front of him. 
and you know Marwan's behind him mocking him and Rasulullah says that uh, be this way and so for the rest of his life that's how he walked this exaggerated fashion of walking uh, the other thing that, that people agree upon or the scholars agree upon is that he like Rasulullah would have secret meetings with certain companions you know because they're making plans on on okay you know so and so tribe is doing such and such so we need to go deal with them uh, and he would eavesdrop and then spread the news uh, and there are even other things you know so there's a whole host of things that he did uh, to the point that eventually he is exiled I mean and we have to understand here this isn't just anybody exiling him this is the Rasulullah exiling him who tolerated everybody you know, who, who said that you know if, if, if you know if no one will accept you come and we will accept you and yet you know because of all of his things he's exiled and along with him goes you know he takes his son Marwan he had many children and he's exiled to Taif which is where he ends up uh, and so so Marwan grows up in this environment with this father, uh, you know, as part of this exile. And there was one time actually, you know, because people would bring their children, uh, like, you know, to see the Rasulullah system. It's not very clear whether Marwan was ever brought to see Rasulullah system in childhood. That's one question that comes up, uh, whether he was or, or was not. Uh, according to Imam Bukhari and various other muhaddithin, they do not accept Marwan as a Sahabi. Uh, this is someone who's from the time of the Tabi, even though he was born during the time of Rasulullah system but the question of whether, and even if he had seen him, you know, again, the other things that he does will be, make it very clear as to who he really is and what category he falls into under these verses of Surah Tawbah. Because you also have to keep in mind that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said to Ali that only a believer will love you and only a hypocrite will have animosity against you. Yeah. Um, Most scholars agree that Marwan was the cause of the assassination of Uthman. Because what happens is during the time of Rasulullah, of course, he's exiled with his father, or his father is exiled and, and he's, he goes with him. Uh, and there are other th statements that Rasulullah made about his father uh, that Allah subhanahu wa made that you know, the curse of Allah is upon him and his progeny except those who are believers. Which is where Umar bin Abdul Aziz comes in. And we'll get to that as well. So when Marwan, you know, is, you know, so Rasulullah some passes, Marwan is still, you know, a young boy. Uh, Abu Bakr Radim becomes a Khalifa. Uh, and Abu Bakr rather make sure that Hakam stays far away from Medina and Makkah. Uh, Umar rather becomes the Khalifa. So here, this is you know by the end of the Khilafah of Umar rather you have another 12 years after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then eventually Uthman well Uthman rather becomes the Khalifa, and he. You know, because Hakam is his uncle, Marwan is his cousin, first cousin. And he uh, basically allows Hakam, because Hakam's become very old by this time, uh, to come back to Mecca and then eventually uh, to Medina Munawar. And along with him, of course, comes 
مروان uh, how come the eyes toward the end of the khilaf of Uthman but during this time Marwan is very I guess you could say very sly so he eventually also becomes the son-in-law of Uthman as well as the uh, basically kind of the uh, uh, chief um, I guess sec what you could equate to today would be like Secretary of State. So he handled all of the state matters and is handling those state matters. Uh, he's the one who, you know, we talked about the martyrdom of Uthman, Radiolana. So if you remember, he is the one. So this is the same Marwan who, you know, when the uh, rebels came from Egypt, in other places, but the rebels from Egypt finally came to an agreement with Uthman Radiolana, and then they sent, you know, he, he, he agreed to change the, uh, the governor of Egypt to Muhammad bin Abu Bakr Radiolana become the governor of Egypt and those with him, and so you have a small group with him going back to Egypt, well, and then they intercept a letter uh, because they see this camel and this man traveling on a camel, and they realize that this is the camel of Uthman, and this is the slave of Uthman, going towards Egypt. And they, when they intercept him, they catch him, and they find this letter with the seal of Uthman on it. And the letter basically says that when they arrive, kill them all. So when they come back, and you know, Uthman is shown the letter, he says, look, the camel is mine, the slave is mine, the letter is not mine. And then they say, well, Marwan is the one who did this. Yeah. You know, but they don't have any proof, and of course, you know, these people are very sly, you know, just like Abdullah ibn Ubay, uh, during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu when he uh, accuses the wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu of indecency. Well, he did it in such a manner that no one could accuse him of, cu of accusing her. You know, he's the one who got the rumor going but he was never punished for it because of the way he did things. Yeah. So now, here, you know, he, this, you know, Marwan has mastered this art uh, of the plausible deniability. So this letter is the one, is what eventually leads to the martyrdom of Uthman. And I'm not going to go over the details of that again, because we've talked about that before. Uh, but just, you know, and this is something that most, if not all, truly Sunni scholars accept. That, yeah, he's the one who basically caused that, was the trigger for all of this. Uh, uh, this is the same Marwan who... You know, when Ali Radhan becomes the Khalifa, he goes to, to Mecca, joins the army of Aisha Radhiallahu which is basically headed by Talha and Zubair Radhiallahu And if you remember when we spoke about this, you know, during that battle of, battle of the camel, uh, you know, when the, because the fighting starts in confusion and in the middle of the night, well, Marwan is the one who shot an arrow that hit the back of the knee of Talha and, and from which he, because it cut the popliteal plop, artery there, so he could, they couldn't stop the bleeding. He eventually bleeds out and, and passes. And he says that I have taken revenge. Uh, Marwan says, I have taken revenge for the murder of Uthman. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't need to, uh, you know, uh, take revenge from anyone else. And this is something that, again, pretty much every legitimate Sunni scholar acknowledges, that he's the one who murdered Talha Radio. Talha Radio is a Sahabi. He's not just any Sahabi. He is Ashram Mubashira. He is amongst the heroes of Uhud. Uh, you know, 
and so he has very special place among the companions of Rasulullah so some very special place uh, with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Marwan even though he's supposed to be from the same army you know it's one thing okay he was fighting against him which still would be wrong but he killed him claiming to be that he's part of his army <laughs> okay. and then he, he he bragged about it later on and even his son, Abdul Malik, who will become the king later on, acknowledges that his father did this. And he says, Abdul Malik says that if his father had not done that, then he would have taken revenge from all of the, the children of Talha, for the murder of Uthman, which is also a fabricated thing that they came up with just to justify their actions. Because Talha had nothing to do with the murder of Uthman. But it's all like today, you know, like with the governments, you know, and, and groups that, you know, they create the problem themselves, and then they themselves are the ones, oh, we've got the solution for this. I mean, we see this all around. So no different than as it is today. Uh, hypocrites are more and more common now, unfortunately. So... So that's another point to, to, to remember uh, about him, about this Marwan. And, you know, when Ali was told, uh, you know, because the people that Talha was killed, you know, in, in that battle, and if you remember Zubair Radiyan, when we spoke about this board, Zubair Radiyan, after he, you know, Ali Radiyan reminded him of the saying of Rasulullah so some Zubair Radiyan took off and left because he asked, what do I do? Ali Radiyan says, leave. Some of them followed him and then they killed him while he was in, in making Salat in this valley. And then they brag about, oh, you know, I killed so-and-so, I killed so-and-so. So when Ali Radhan was told, uh, so Ali, you know, about this, about Marwan killing Talha and about, uh, you know, I forget the name of the other guy that killed Zubair, uh, Radhiallahu anhu. Uh, you know, he said that, uh, you know, give them the, the tidings he said, give them the tidings of, of the hellfire. You know, give them the news that they will enter the fire for this. You know, which also tells you again that this can't be a Sahabi because no Sahabi will enter the fire. And yet Ali Radha was saying that this guy will you know, burn for this, for this action of his. Marwan is the same person who, as I've talked about before, could not open his mouth without cursing Ali or Ahl al-Bayt. Yeah. So, I mean, he is the governor in, in, in Medina. So he leads the Salat in the, in the Masjid of the Prophet He also gives the Khutbah in the Masjid of the Prophet He also leads the Salat of Eid and gives the Khutbah of Eid. Okay. Uh, so what he did, you know, because part of his Khutbah was cursing Ali, rather than cursing Ahl al-Bayt. And the way he would curse him, he says, Allah's curse be upon Ali and his progeny. Or Allah's curse be upon Ahlul Bayt. Uh, and so he would do this. And this was common. And, and the problem was that the people were scared. So, and we were talking about this with the, some of the brothers the other day. Because anyone who challenged their position or their authority would be killed. One way or the other, they would they would get you. So when Marwan, you know, he would because he would do this, you know, like Imam Hassan al Islam would not come and listen to his khutbah. And why is he going to be listening to the khutbah when he's cursing Ali, cursing his father, cursing Ahl al Bayt, cursing whoever? Uh, one time he was passing by, and Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein al Islam were standing together, 
uh, and Marwan, he said some, some words and, you know, Imam Hussein al-Islam got upset and was going to, was you know, responding to him and Imam Hassan al-Islam said, you know, told, asked him to settle down. And then Marwan says that Allah's curse be upon uh, Ali and, and Ahlul Bayt. And so Imam Hassan al-Islam responds to him, he says, you say this, you know, when you are the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed, you and your father are the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed through the lips of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, so the Jummah Khutbah, you know, because people wouldn't come and listen. One time, you know, Imam Hassan al-Islam, you know, during, during, you know, Khutbah started. So he went to the house of Bibi Fatima. So if you know the layout of the Masjid of Rasulullah you know, you had the house of Aisha right there. You had like, you know, the member, the house of Aisha where Rasulullah was buried along with Abu Bakr and Umar and Aisha still lives there. So this is an important point to remember. You know, when she still lives in that same house right next to the graves. She sleeps right there. She makes salat there. Yeah. And we'll come back to those points later on, inshallah. Maybe not today, but later. And then you had the house of Fatima, salamu alayhi which of course, you know, no one really lived in, but this was still her house, which was right next to it, right behind it. And so he came and he went into the house. And so Marwan saw that, you know, he wasn't, and he really knew that he wasn't coming for the khutbahs and, and stuff. Eventually he will ban him from coming anyway to the masjid. Uh, because he's afraid that, you know, people looking at him will get uh, emotion. Well, their emotions will wake them up. Uh, and they will do something against him. So he sends word by a man. He sends a man to go give him, give Imam Hassan al-Islam a message. And the message that he gives, the man comes and he says, this is, you know, Marwan asked me to give you a message. He says, what's the message? He says, uh, Marwan said that your anal the analogy of you and your father is like that of a mule. For those who don't know, you know, a mule, the father of the mule is a donkey. The mother of the mule is a horse. So he says, he says that he said for me to tell you that your, the analogy of you and your father is like that of a mule. When you ask the mule who his father is, he says, my mother is a horse. So, you know, you think about what he just said. You know, he's insulting, you know, all of Ahlul Bayt. He's insulting Ali, he's insulting Hazrat Abu Talib, and just, you know, just, uh, you know, so, uh, again, you know, Imam Hassan al-Islam you know, responded by saying that, you know, he is the one who Allah SWT has cursed through the lips of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, so, you know, people of course wouldn't come to his khutbah, and a lot of people what they would do is they, you know, they wouldn't come for the khutbah, but they would come for the salat. Uh, and so what Marwan started doing was he would lengthen, lengthen the khutbah to the extent that they would get into the time of Asr. And there are various narrations where you have companions in the back standing up and making their salat on their own because time for Asr is starting. And again, people ask, well, why didn't the people, you know, do anything? Again, you know, there's that fear because they knew what, 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 these people were capable of doing, not just capable of doing, what these people would do, definitely would do. Uh, the other thing that Marwan did, because people also, because again, and for the same reason that he would not, uh, or for the, same, for the reason that his, he would use his khutbah to curse Ali, right, to curse Ahl al-Bayt, so the people would not come to listen for his Eid khutbah, and what they would do is, they would come to Eid Salat, 
And as soon as they finish the Salat, because, you know, Juma Khutbah is before the Salat. Eid Khutbah is after the Salat. So in Eid, what, he, what, what would happen is that he would lead the Eid Salat, and then he would make Salam, and everybody would get up and leave. Right. Wouldn't listen to his Khutbah. So what he did was he started making Eid Khutbah before the Salat. So, you know, they would get to the Salat, and there are various narrations, uh, which are in Bukhari and Muslim, where one time, you know, he's going for Eid Salat, and what he did was, and this is what these people do, you know, people who have no standing, who have no real status, they try to associate themselves with those people that are decent and good. And that's associate in the sense that they're going to, you know, really associate and try to be like them. What I mean by associate is they, they want like the photo ops these days. You know, somebody famous, oh, you know, selfie with somebody famous, oh, I'm, see, I'm connected with them. So people start making that connection, oh, you know, he's with him or this person supports him, which was not the case at all. So on the way to Eid, he stops by the house of Abu Sayyid Khudri, who was a very well-respected companion of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was very old, so he goes by the house, he gets him, he says, let's go to eat Salat together, and he's bringing him to eat Salat, you know, so that Abu Sayyid is, is, you know, he's old, so he's leaning on Marwan to get to the Salat. And the narration, uh, or the Hadith goes that they get to the eat Salat, and, you know, they have built a member there too. Yeah. So Marwan is going towards the member, and Abu Sayyid Khudi uh, is bringing him towards the, the, uh, the, you know, where he needs to lead the Salat. And then Abu Sayyid says, look, you know, Sunnah is to make the Salat first and then the Khutbah. He says, and his response is, that's the old way. That, that's the, that's the uh, outdated way of doing this. This is the real way of doing, the new way. Again, he would do this because the people would leave and they wouldn't listen to his Khutbah. And it's funny because I was listening to these two guys that were trying to defend him. And they mentioned the hadith. And they see, see, he explained why he had to do this. So he had to do this. <laughs> you know, he had, he had to violate the sunnah of Rasulullah so, so this is, I mean, they didn't say, use those words, but that's exactly what they're saying. He had to create this bidah asaya, this, this innovation that break, that, that violates and goes against the sunnah of Rasulullah so, so which is the which is the bidah that will take you to hell, that is in the fire, and yet these same people who accuse us of doing bidah when we celebrate the Mawlid of Rasulullah are justifying this action of Marwan. So, you know, I mean that that much should be enough to kind of give you a picture of who this man is. Uh, but there's more. <laughs> you know, it doesn't end there. So he is the murderer of Uthman. He is the murderer of various other companions of Rasul. I mean, he, well, he's indirectly the murderer of Uthman because he created the environment for that to happen. He is the direct murderer of Talha. He is also the direct murderer of various other companions of Rasulullah, including Noman bin Bashir and various others. Did he die Well, uh, did he ever live as Muslim? <laughs> the question is, did he die Kafir? Did he ever live as Muslim? He never repented for any of this stuff. In, in, in fact, he bragged about all of this stuff. So he never made a tawbah? He never made tawbah. Did he get buried in a landfill with a bunch of trash on it? No, that's, his, that's Yazid. That's before him. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So he never... You know, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, when, when someone knows who Rasulullah is, when someone knows who Ahl al-Bayt are, and yet they do these things despite of that, because he also made a statement. He made a statement to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein al he, where he says that, uh, you know, your father and Ahl al-Bayt were the biggest defenders of Uthman. The reason I was asking that question, I know a lot of people named their kids with their son or one. Because, because they don't know anything. 
I mean, I know a lot of people. Yes. Child marijuana growing up, you know, they they look at them old marijuana and use their yeah. religious name, this and that. You know, so well, that was the reason that I was asking if he died capital or not. Yeah. Right? Well, the thing is, these are the, most of these people are fed the propaganda that he was the leader of the Muslims because he will be the leader of uh, of, of of Banu Umayyah for about a year or nine months or so. Uh, that he, uh, you know, he loved the Quran. Well, you know, because he, he recited the Quran so much and all these other things. Hajjaj bin Yusuf, you know, he was Hafiz of Quran. So this gets back to, you have to re remember, Rasulullah says when he described the Khawarij, he described them how? Telling the companions that you will be ashamed of your recitation, right? Uh, when he, uh, and so here, another point to understand here, you know, with all of these deviant mindsets, you have those that are openly Khawarij. So the Khawarij at that time, not only were the enemies of the household of Rasulullah system, they were also the enemies of anyone in authority. So they fought against, not only they fought against Ali and Imam Hassan al-Islam, they also fought against uh, Mabia and Banu Umayyah. So they hated everybody, and for them, everybody was kafir. But then you have the other group, which is really a branch. Today, these are the branches of the of the of Banu Umayyah, of, not Banu, but, but branches of uh, uh, of the Khawarij, which you know the technical term for them are the Nasabi. And the Nasabi, what they do is they try to belittle the status of Ahlul Bayt compared to Banu Umayyah. And so they raise the status of Banu Umayyah, you know, either putting it on par or at the same level of Ahlul Bayt or above them. Uh, and this is why, and this has become very prevalent uh, even amongst those that are supposed to be Sunni. Uh, even amongst those, like in the subcontinent, those and those people who, who hear this, those who claim to be Barelui, uh, and yet, you know, and they say Ya Rasulullah, they celebrate the Maulid of Rasulullah Sallallahu and yet, you know, when when it comes to Ali, Radhiyallahu or Ahl al Bayt or Imam Hassan al Islam, you know, they always want to try to uh, defend those who they fought against. Um, yeah. So I have one more question. Why Imam Muslim brought him back? I know they were cousin and ankle, but yeah. don't you think he break a Rasulullah promise or agreement or something? Okay, yeah, that's a common question as to why did Uthman uh -huh. bring him back and did this not violate the the um, Rasulullah in the exile uh -huh. that Rasulullah system had placed. There are people who say, no, he wasn't exiled, which, you know, if you look at all of the sources, it, it becomes very clear. Uh, and you also, if you look at all the sources, as far as Hakam is concerned, everybody agrees, like I said on that first point, that he used to mock the Prophet Sallallahu That in itself, you know, should have gotten him beheaded, uh, or, or was worthy of getting him beheaded. Uh, but Uthman, Radion, you have to understand the environment, the situation. You have a situation where, you know, Uthman, of course, when he's martyred, he's like 84 years old. So when he becomes the Khalifa, he's 72 years old. So he's older, uh, and then you don't have a lot of people around uh, anymore that he can rely on uh, completely. So, you know, so in those situations, you tend to rely on family members more. And there's this mindset amongst people that are very soft-hearted, which Uthman Radion was, you know, and, and we see this even, you know, with ourselves today that, oh, you know, if, if you know, if they would just listen to us just for a little while, they would understand. Right? But that 
You know, that's not the reality of the situation. Or, you know, if I'm, if I'm nice to them, they will change and become good. Uh, and so, again, you know, Uthman, Radil, understanding what they had done or what, his, what Hakam had done. But also with that mind thinking that, oh, you know, yeah, uh, you know if, if we're good to him, then he'll repent or he'll change. So that's why he brought him back. Uh, understanding that the exile was for a certain time. You know, so, so he said, okay, you know, he exiled him because he did these bad things, but now he's older, he's weaker, he's changed, he can't do those things, so now we'll bring him back. So this was the mindset. I mean, whether he should have or should not have technically, I'm not going to answer that question. However, the thing that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about Uthman is that at the time of Tabuk, when Uthman did so much, Rasulullah Sussam made a statement. He said that it doesn't matter what Uthman does after this, it cannot ruin anything of his. So this also shows us the authority of Rasulullah Sussam. It also tells us that there are things that Uthman will do that will be questionable. Because otherwise, Rasulullah Sussam wouldn't have made that statement. So there will be things that he does that will be questionable, but Rasulullah Sussam has given him Inshallah, we'll, I'll, I'll go over this with you later on. Okay? So, there will be things that, that he does that will be questionable. Otherwise, there was no need for Rasulullah to make that statement. If everything he did after that was not questionable, then why would he make the statement? There would be, he, said, he said, nothing he does after this point will ruin anything of his. So again, this shows us the authority of Rasulullah Sussam because, you know, how can he, if he doesn't have authority, then how can he uh, give uh, exemption for anything that comes after a certain point? He tells us he has authority. Allah SWT has given him the authority. You know, like a law, you have a law, you know, and, and like somebody uh, uh, violates a certain law, and you pardon him. Okay. So you can pardon him, you know, and even pardoning him for a, for a violation of a law takes authority. But to pardon him for, for, for any violation down the road takes even more authority. So, so anyone who starts criticizing Uthman Radio over this needs to understand what Rasulullah Sussan said about Uthman and you know, very clearly. So we, there is no room for us to criticize him. You know, technically, you know, whether he should not or should not, again, that's a different issue. But, but he did. You know, out of the softness of his heart, he brought him back. Uh, again, thinking that, oh, you know, he will, he will change or he will be better or he will be right. Uh, but so as far as the Nasabi again you have these people that have become very prevalent in society now uh, because they blend in so well you know, until you come to this question and then suddenly you realize oh there's something majorly wrong here you know? um, Yeah, and then, you know, like I said, there's so many other things, but the one point that I want to bring up again here with Marwan and who he is in the last few minutes, and I'll end with this today uh, in order that we understand, like, next week when we talk about Imam Hassan al-Islam. And, and again, this will give you the picture that he's coming back to, the environment that, that's going to be in Medina at that time. Uh, is later on, 
So this will be after the martyrdom of Imam Hassan al Islam. Uh, you know, Mahavia uh, appoints or assigns Yazid to be his heir. So he basically makes him crown prince. And he writes a letter to Marwan to make the announcement of this declaration. So Marwan, Juma Khutbah, of course, he's got to curse Ali, Rabiana. And then, you know, he goes and he makes, uh, he makes the uh, announcement. But the way he makes the announcement is he says that, you know, that uh, that Mavia Radio has appointed Yazid to be his uh, successor after him. Uh, and this is a point we're going to come back to later on as well, because if you remember, this violates the agreement that was made. Successor after him, so Yazid will be the successor after him, uh, just like. Abu Bakr uh, appointed Omar Radhan to be his successor. All right. All right. uh, so the hadith is in Say Bukhari. And here's the hadith that's in Say Bukhari. As we've talked about before, there are many hadith in Say Bukhari that Imam Bukhari summarized a lot of aspects too because of the environment he was in uh, so that he, he you know he could get things pushed through uh, otherwise they would kill him or not publish him because of governmental controls and regulations and censorship just like today uh, you know so Marwan I mean so when when he makes this statement, and in the Hadith in Bukhari, Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr, Radion, the brother of Aisha Siddiqa, Radion, the son of Abu Bakr, Radion, he stands up, and in Bukhari the narration is that he 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 and that some some words were exchanged. So words were exchanged, and then you know so Marwan says for him to be arrested. And so he runs into the house of his sister, uh, the house of the wife of Rasulullah and the house of Rasulullah uh, you know, there in the masjid. Because it's right, you know, attached to the masjid. The house never moved. The masjid hasn't moved, but it's right there. So he goes into her house, and because it's her house, then now they can't enter her house. So Marwan, again, in Bukhari, comes and he says some words uh, to which Aisha, Aisha Siddiqa and, and this is if you if you want to find the hadith in Bukhari it's in the section where of the Fasir of verse number 17 of surah number 46 right. so surah uh, the winding sands or uh, Surah Hamim or Ahqaf, Surah Ahqaf. Okay. Um, and so, so when he runs in uh, and they can't enter, so Marwan he comes and he recites this verse of verse number 17 where Allah SWT says, But there is one who says to his parents, Oof, you know, fie on you. Do you hold out the promise to me that I shall be raised up even though generations have passed before me without rising again? And they, and they too seek Allah's aid and rebuke the son. Woe to thee, have faith, for the promise of Allah is true. But he says, this is nothing but tales of the ancient. Okay, so he recites this verse where Allah SWT talks about a son who... Uh, you know, the parents of the son are trying to bring him to guidance, and he's, you know, Ugh, you know, are you telling me this? No, this is all stories of the ancient. So Marwan, he recites this verse and says that this verse was revealed 
for Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr. This was revealed for you. And Aisha Siddiqa steps forward. She's still in the house, but she comes and very loudly, uh, you know, responds, saying that uh, that Oh Marwan, there is no verse of the Quran that was revealed uh, uh, in uh, for the ha for the children of Abu Bakr, except the verses that were revealed in my defense. So, and then she says, she says, and I know who this verse was revealed for. So one point here to, to note is, you have Marwan, who is purposefully misinterpreting the Quran. I mean, it's not by accident. You know, he's basically, oh, this applies to you, and this applies to you, to whoever he wants. He knows that this isn't for Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr. He purposefully is, t is, giving, is misinterpreting the Quran. So someone like that, does he have any iman? No. Okay. So this is the narration in, in, in Sayyid Bukhari. But then you have, okay, as I said, Imam Bukhari, he says words were exchanged. Well, what words were exchanged? So we find those in Hakim and Nisa'i, which are all narrations that are say and accepted as say. And in those narrations, or a hadith, you know, is the words that were exchanged is when, when Marwan says that just like Abu Bakr appointed Umar to be the Khalifa after him, so Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr stands up and he says, this isn't a sunnah of Abu Bakr and Umar, this is the way of, of uh, Qaisar and Qisra you know, the kings of Persia and the kings of Rome. And so when he says this, Marwan says, oh, arrest him. And so he immediately runs into the house of, of his sister, Aisha Siddiqa, radiallahu and she goes, and this is when the rest of the exchange takes place. And he says, oh, this verse was revealed for you. You are that disobedient son. And Aisha Radha says, no, this wasn't revealed for him. This was revealed for someone else. And he says, I know who it was revealed for. She doesn't you know, point out who it was revealed for. But, and she also says, and if you look at the rest of this, she says, you know, because they also summarize that in, in Bukhari, it doesn't say this, but again, in Mustadrak and Nisai, it says, and, and she says, and you, Marwan, you are the one who... Who, who, whom uh, Allah subhanahu wa has cursed through the lips of Rasulullah Sallallahu when you were still in the loins of your father. So this is Aisha radiallahu for whom Rasulullah Sallallahu said, take two-thirds of, of your religion from her. She's saying, you're the one who was cursed by Allah through the lips of Rasulullah Sallallahu when you were still in the loins of your father. Because Rasulullah Sallallahu said, you know, Allah's curse be upon Hakam and his progeny, except for those who believe. And from every action and every statement of Marwan, we can see he's not of those who believe. You know, just the fact that he is cursing, and anyone who wouldn't curse Ali, uh, he would, uh, you know, like any official, in the government who would not, he would, you know, rebuke them. Now, this is what you have to do. So anyone who curses Ali is a hypocrite. And as we spoke just at the beginning, the verses of Surah Tawbah, you have hypocrites. And Ali is that demarcation of belief and hypocrisy. Um... One point I'm coming back to, uh, and then I'll end, you know, unless there are questions, uh, is that, uh, you know, as, as I said earlier, Marwan, he said to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein al-Islam, that your father and the household, and, your, and that household, your household, uh, were the biggest defenders of Uthman. Yeah. And yet he's doing all of this nonsense with the excuse of, oh, we're taking revenge for Uthman. Right? And yet he himself acknowledges that they were the big, largest 
the, the, the biggest defenders of Uthman. And when they say, well, then why do you, you know, do this to us all? You know, and this, is, this isn't nothing, this isn't anything new or old, because we're seeing this today too. World War II. The Jews were being persecuted in Europe. They're trying to find security anywhere. And everyone is rejecting them, including the U.S. You know, there's a whole ship that was returned, that, that, that the United States refused to allow to board, to, to, to dock at the port, because it, it was a, a ship full of Jewish people from Europe escaping the persecution in Europe. Who were the people that gave them safe haven? The Palestinians. You know, all these European Jews that came to, to Philistine were welcomed and given safe haven from the persecution in Europe. And now you see those same people, what they're doing to the people that defended them. So, you know, when you start looking at all of this history, you start seeing all these comparisons. Uh, and, uh, you know, literally history repeating itself. You know. So I'm going to end here with, with, uh, with today, sort of, with Marwan. Uh, but you know, I'm going to be talking about him as we go on. There's so many things that will happen. Uh, but uh, any questions? What, uh, what he given that name? Yeah, I don't even know what it means. I've never bothered to look that up. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it has probably some decent meaning. I seen the video where it said Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave him that he his name was something else, but he told people to call him. Um, in the Hakim, I don't. There's some of the videos I try to look up, but some of them are Arabic and some of them, one of them I turned off and he said he's like a Muslim caliph and they try to. Yeah, we'll come to that. So I just, I just cut it off. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, these are people that worship uh, oppressors. Uh, that, you know, so anyone in authority. Like today, you know, again, and this is what I was talking about after Friday uh, a little bit, I kind of mentioned it. You know, you have these people uh, that are kind of like the. Uh, courtsmen in the king's court uh, and they literally worship the king because they worship authority uh, and so it doesn't matter what the king does they're going to push that forward uh, and so these are people oh see he was at one time the leader of the Muslims well yeah he was he was the leader of the of, of the Muslim empire but I wouldn't say that he was the leader of the Muslims themselves okay. there is a difference there like today here, you know, you got people say, oh, not my president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so, uh, you know, so, so yeah, he was at one time the caliph. And of course, all of these kings called themselves the caliphs. But they were kings. They were not khalifas. Because they didn't rule like khalifas. Uh, but they were kings because the Rasulullah Sallallahu said they were kings. Yeah. Um... So yeah, so you're going to see those people that try to defend him, you know, every which way, and they'll bring out these, these, I guess, uh, these narrations, uh, which go totally against what we know from the Quran and the Sunnah. So if, if I, so they'll bring these historical narrations out, which are basically by people, by their own people. You know, like, you know, the victor writes the history. So they were kings at one time, which means they're the ones who are dictating the history. Uh, and so they'll bring those narrations out and say, oh, see, he was such a good person. Okay. Which goes against, like, you know, like I said, this is a hadith which violates the hadith because the hadith here, like in, in uh, you know, as far as him changing uh, the Eid khutbah, that's not in the history books. That's in the Hadith books. Him accusing Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr, and then eventually him, actually I didn't go over this, but eventually him assass having him assassinated because it becomes very clear even from the Hadith that he was killed. He didn't just die. 
uh, and the companions at that time, you know, basically make these statements as well. Yeah, he, he didn't this guy, he was killed. Um, and so the way, like, Abdul Rahman and Abu Bakr, you know, he, he hides in the house of his sister for a while. He can't stay there for a long time, so he sneaks out and eventually makes his way toward Mecca, and then he's found dead in a cave close to Mecca. Uh, uh, conveniently. And he's buried in Mecca, and Aisha Siddiqa, his sister, she eventually, when she goes to Umrah, she will go and visit the grave of her brother. And she'll make some statements. Which also, for those who, who make these statements that, oh, women cannot go to the graveyard. Well, she didn't know that. Why is she going to the, if, if that's the accurate statement, then why is she going to the graveyard? And, 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 and you know, because people say, oh, you know, she would go to the grave of her. She lived next to the grave of, of her father and the grave of Rasulullah and the grave of Omar. She had, once Omar was buried there, she had a partition put up, you know, just a curtain put up there, you know, because he's non, non mahram But she continued to live right there. Same house. So, so yeah, so you're going to see those people that, oh, he was the king. And like, like even today, like, you know, when, when these so called kings in the Muslim world, oh, you can't talk against the king. You can't talk against the Muslim ruler. Uh, so there's no shortage of those people. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so Marwan, you know, if you, if, like, we, we're going over his actual history that we can, that I can defend uh, from various ha hadiths that are considered say by, by even by Albani, you know, who's the, who is the muhaddis of the modern day Salafis. You know, uh, and also the hadiths, you know, various hadiths throughout. Uh, you know, but again, even him changing the khutbah, and then this narration, or this hadith in Bukhari where he basically literally uh, misinterprets the verse of the Quran, you know, and not out of, you know, not by mistake, but on purpose to defend his own position. Uh, I mean, that in itself should be enough for someone to realize, oh, you know, there's something not right with this guy. But like, as I was saying, it's funny, those same guys, those same guys that are defending Marwan and even defending him changing the khutbah uh, to making it, you know, af uh, before the salat instead of after the salat on Eid, um, you know, which is bidda, and not just any bidda. Bidda, you know, they, they keep bringing the hadith, kullu bidatin dalala, kullu dalalatin finnar, that every uh, innovation is misguidance and every misguidance is in the fire. But the bidah there is the bidah that, that violates the sunnah of Rasulullah And here he's obviously violating the sunnah. And not just violating the sunnah of Rasulullah He violates it and then he justifies violating it. And then he actually insults the sunnah of Rasulullah by saying, oh, that's the old way. You know, that way has been replaced with my way. <laughs> I mean, how, I mean, and this again, this isn't, I'm not quoting the history books here. I'm quoting the hadith. Okay? So, yeah, so you're going to see plenty of those people. There's no shortage of that. Yeah, I didn't know. I just cut it off. I yeah. Saying, I just cut it off. Yeah. Yeah, it becomes yeah. obvious. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no sense in wasting your time with that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So if no other questions, we'll end here today, inshallah. Yeah, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our hearts with his love and the love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all those whom they love. And may he uh, you know, protect our brothers and give victory to our brothers and sisters in Palestine uh, and protect them from the oppressors. And uh, may he give guidance to the oppressors. And if guidance is not for them, then may he destroy them. Uh, 
واخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله